Today's video is going to be all about inherited or beneficiary IRAs. This is a kind of retirement account that you get, you inherit from somebody else who had it first. There's all sorts of rules surrounding them. There are mistakes made all the time. There's just a whole bunch of confusion surrounding these types of accounts. We're going to try to clear up some of that in this video. We'll split the video into two parts. The first part will cover some of the logistics of what you can do, what you can't do, the why and the how. The second part of it will have to do with your annual distribution requirements from the account. You have to take a little bit of money out of the account every year. We'll talk through all that stuff on the second part of this video. So here's how this stuff works. Once you die, there is someone appointed to handle your estate and, and the, the local court will name what's called an executor of your estate. They'll have a bunch of death certificates that they'll need to use to prove your death and um, work through the, pro the probate process and the distribution of your accounts. So let's say that John Smith has an IRA at Vanguard with half a million dollars in it. And let's say that um, that half a million dollars is invested in an S&P 500 index fund. Well, John's executor is going to have a bunch of death certificates after John dies. The first thing that happens is his executor calls Vanguard and says, hey, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I have bad news, but John is dead. Here is his death certificate. Vanguard is going to send their condolences and say, okay, uh, we can help with the processing and the distribution of John's account. What they do next, once they validate the death certificate, is look up who the beneficiaries are that they have on file. Because as you might know, retirement accounts like IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks, Roth 401ks, and the like, pass by contract. They don't go through probate. They pass by contract based on those beneficiary designations that are important to fill out. So Vanguard will take a look at who the beneficiaries are they have on file. Let's say that John had two kids, Jane and Sally, and he named them 50-50 beneficiaries of the account. So at this, point, at this point, Vanguard is going to reach out to Jane and Sally based on the contact information that they have and say that and notify them that they are a beneficiary of John's account and they will help them open beneficiary IRAs at Vanguard. One in Jane's name, one in Sally's name. They're both unique account numbers. Jane and Sally, once those accounts are open, Jane can control hers, Sally can control hers. And then Vanguard's going to process the distribution. They'll take half of what was in John's account, so 250,000 of that S&P 500 fund, move that into Jane's account and the other half and move that into Sally's account. It's not a taxable event. It's all occurring um, in a tax deferred manner. It's not taxable income to John or his estate. It's not taxable income to Jane or Sally individually. It's all processed on a tax deferred basis. And once those assets are in Jane and Sally's accounts, they can do whatever they want with them. They can sell the fund. They can take the money out. They can reinvest into different investments if they want. They can transfer the money to another brokerage firm. It's under their discretion. So let's say that Jane, for example, wants to keep her account at Vanguard, but maybe Sally has other accounts at like Fidelity or Charles Schwab, and she wants to consolidate all her accounts at one brokerage firm, which is pretty common. Well, Sally could sell the assets in the beneficiary IRA and move the cash over to Schwab or Fidelity if she wanted. She could also transfer the assets just directly to the other brokerage firm. The way that she would do that is she would reach out to the other brokerage firm, Fidelity or Schwab or what have you, and ask for help opening a beneficiary IRA at that brokerage firm. Now, this part's important. If you're someone who's inherited IRAs from different people, you have more than one of these things, you have to have an inherited IRA for each person you've inherited from. You have to have a unique account for each decedent, meaning the person who's died, because the amount of money that you have to take out of the accounts on an annual basis depends on that original owner's date of birth and date of death. So Sally is going to call Fidelity. She'll ask for help. Fidelity will open a beneficiary IRA in her name with John's name on there and his date of birth and date of death and information attached to it. Then she can transfer the S&P 500 fund from the Vanguard account to her own beneficiary IRA at Fidelity. 
Again, not a taxable event. She doesn't even need to sell the S&P 500 fund if she doesn't want to. But the important part is that if she, if Sally's someone who has beneficiary IRAs from multiple people who've died, she does not commingle those funds. You have to keep them separate. Now, once, in a, once a beneficiary IRA has been opened in your name, and once money has been put into it and the distribution from the original account has been processed, there's a couple things that need to happen. The first one has to do with the original owner's mandatory distribution. Now, the, the deal with mandatory distributions is that these IRAs provide a great tax deferral and great tax benefit. And the reason that they exist is because the government wants us to save for our own retirement. So they offer these great tax benefits, but they don't allow us to keep money in these accounts forever because, yeah, they, uh, they want us to save for retirement and allow us to defer taxation, but that deferral doesn't last forever. And when you own, when you have an IRA and you get into your mid seventies, age 75 and older, you actually have to start taking money out of them every year because the IRS has been waiting to tax you on this the entire time you've deferred taxation. So the first thing that you need to do is determine what the date of uh, birth and the date of death were from the person who pa- of the person who passed away and determine whether they had an obligation to take a distribution this year or not. Because if the person who passed away was 45 and not old enough yet to have to take their distribution, then you don't have to worry about this. But if they were 85, they had to take money out of the accounts this year. And what you need to do is determine how much they should have taken out and whether they did that. Because if this person died at the beginning of January, then they may not have, they may have passed away before they got around to taking this year's distribution. And if they didn't, you have to take this year's distribution for them, even though the assets are now in your account. So if the distribution requirement for the year was $2,000 and John Smith died at the beginning of January, then you have to, if you're the only beneficiary, you have to take $2,000 out of your account to satisfy that distribution that John simply never got around to. And in Jane and Sally's case, that means that they both have to take $1,000 out to satisfy that year's distribution. Okay, so the first step is determining whether or not the person who died had to take a distribution. If they did take it, you're good. If they didn't take it, then you need to take it Uh, on their behalf. The next step is determining what your ongoing distribution requirements are going to be from there. Remember, the IRS has allowed a deferral of tax on all this money for a long time, so they don't let you keep the money in this account forever, right? Now, this is where the complexity lies, because there are three different sets of distribution rules for three different types of beneficiaries. The first type of beneficiary is called an eligible designated beneficiary, and it includes a spouse, a minor child, someone who is chronically ill or disabled as defined by the IRS, or someone who is not more than 10 years younger than the person who died. If you fit any one of those categories, then you're what's considered an eligible designated beneficiary. And if that's the case, your distribution requirements allow you to, the the distribution rules allow you to spread those distributions out over the rest of your life. And that's generally the most favorable kind of treatment here. And the reason is because your distribution requirement every year will be based on your life expectancy. So let's let's toss aside beneficiary IRAs here just for a second. And in your own IRA, these mandatory distributions that I mentioned here a minute ago depend on your life expectancy. So once you turn 75 in your own IRA, you have to start taking money out. The IRS is going to force taxation on some of it. And the way you figure out how much uh, you need to take out is based on you take the account balance on December 31st of the previous year. And you divide by your life expectancy from this actuarial table that the IRS gives you. And there's a million online calculators out there to help you figure this out, by the way. So let's say that you have an account balance uh, the the December 31st of the previous year, and your life expectancy is 25 in that first year. I'm pulling that out of a hat. 
Well, you take the account balance, you divide by 25. That's the amount that you have to take out for that year, and it's considered taxable income. Now, slide forward one year. You're 76. You're one year older. Your life expectancy is roughly one year lower. Now you take the account balance from the end of year one and divide it by 24. First grade arithmetic, remember back to, to, to first grade, you take a numerator and you divide it by a denominator. If the denominator is smaller, that means the result is going to get bigger. And so the whole point here with these mandatory distributions is that as you get older, you're forced to take out a larger and larger portion of the account. Now, if you're an eligible designated beneficiary, because again, you're a spouse, you're a child, you're chronically ill or disabled uh, based on the IRS definitions, or you're not more than 10 years younger than the person who died, you can use that methodology on your own distributions. And that's generally more favorable because if you're, let's say you're 50, you might have a life expectancy of like 35 years based on the tables, which means you get to, to get to divide by a smaller number and you're forced to take less out over the rest of your life. You can always take out more than that minimum. You can take all of it out in year one if you want, but you have more flexibility and latitude if you're an eligible designated beneficiary. Now, the only thing I'll add here is that there's one exception to this. If you inherit an IRA from a spouse, you can treat yourself as an eligible designated beneficiary and go through this whole rigmarole and song and dance and open the beneficiary IRA like we're talking about. That is completely fine. But if you're inheriting an IRA from a spouse, you can also treat that account as your own and simply have an IRA in your own name and circumvent the whole beneficiary IRA nonsense that is causing so much confusion. And oftentimes that is the, the better way for spouses to proceed. But as always, it just depends on the circumstances. All right, that's it for today. I hope you liked it. If you're watching still, you probably did. So make sure that you hit the like button below and let us know what we missed too. In the comment section, let us know your feedback, uh, what resonated with you. Are there other things that people should consider that we missed? This is helpful for everybody when you leave your feedback.